In April 18th, 1955, in Princeton, New Jersey, Dr. Thomas Harvey stood in front of an autopsy table with a scalpel uh, in one hand and this brain in the other. Holding in his hand 1.2 kilograms of Albert Einstein, arguably the most important 1.2 kilograms of it, Dr. Thomas Harvey took sole custody of Einstein's brain. He cut the preserved brain into pieces by anatomical regions and distributed these regions to the leading pathologist of the time. Fast forward 30 years, a UC Berkeley neuroanatomist, Dr. Marion Diamond, gets a hold of four distinct regions of cortex out of Dr. Harvey's collection. These are the regions of the cortex that are involved in abstract reasoning, categorizing information, memory, and planning. So Dr. Diamond set forth to analyze the cellular density and structure in these regions to excavate clues about the nature of extraordinary genius. So she spent countless hours hunched over a microscope, just perhaps thinking the neurons under the lens of the microscope were so much more densely packed or so much more specialized than yours and mine that it enabled its owner to reach mental horizons nobody else could. So data was collected, neurons were counted and compared to controls, 11 men of same age. There was no difference. A neuronal mirror image of what simpletons. There was one difference, however, that jumped out of another data set. In all of the regions examined, the number of cells that were not neurons was off the charts. And here lies the great mystery of today's gliobiology. Here lies one of the greatest swindles in the recent history of science. A century-lasting monopoly in neuroscience that has left a massive hole in the understanding of human brain function. And that's the reason why you have never heard of the name glia. What is a human brain? A hundred billion neurons making a hundred trillion connections, all communicating in an extremely fine-tuned harmony. Pretty fascinating, isn't it? Do you want to know what's even more fascinating? That's only 10% of your brain. 10%. Imagine watching a movie, and I start taking away the background. I, I, I take away the extras, I take away the light, I take away the decor. You're left with a bunch of actors just talking to each other on a white back backdrop. Would you call that a movie? Some might, but I wouldn't. What's the substance of the foreground if you remove, if you strip away 90% of its context. In the same vein, which call a brain a brain if you take away 90% of this context. This is what happened to Glia. They were taken away from the picture in the 19th and 20th century neuroscience when scientists flooded to study the neuron and its electric language. Glia the 90% non-neuronal population of your brain was reduced to being bubble wrap. Just lifeless glue holding neurons together. Just an uninspiring scaffold to an evolutionary wonder that is neuron. But tide, times are changing and they're changing fast. Today, we can identify subtypes of glia. We can assign a vast array of functions to each subtype. And today we realized age-old disorders of the brain, such as ALS, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, even brain cancers, all 
have an imprint of glial dysfunction on them. So there remains one door closed for glia. There remains one frontier that was once so distant that today's glial biologists are still cautious of the implications. Does glia influence behavior? If it does influence behavior, does it partake in the disorders of behavior? What if the ultimate expression of human brain function, the behavior, is a part of not 10%, but 100% of your brain? Three years ago, I was just a new graduate student who knew a little bit of neurobiology, a little bit of genetics, and nothing about glia. Then, in February 2010, I first stepped into the office of Adan Aguirre as he was just setting up, setting up his lab. Without no prior correspondence or without great expectations, I knocked on the door and I asked him. Hi, welcome to Stoddenbrook, I said. Are you looking for students? Well, here I am. To much surprise, he said, OK, start Monday. <laughs> and that day was the first time I was introduced to ng 2 glia, the latest addition to the list of glial subtypes. The, next follow the following Tuesday, I was looking down a microscope, first time face to face with this strange new child of glial biology. Why so strange? And jetuglia are so distinct that they do not quite fit in with the traditional glia, but they are not distinct enough to cross over to the neuronal side. They are sprinkled all over the nervous system, like salt and pepper. They are fine everywhere. They are extremely hyperactive. They divide all the time. And they're the first responders to any kind of insult in the brain. But the most strange thing is about angiotiglia is that they can speak the neuron's language. They can form electrical synapses with neurons that was previously thought to be a neuron-specific feature. But as, a, as anyone who's gone through middle school know, being unique doesn't always help you to be understood. To this day, we know surprisingly little, little about what this cachet of functions in Jutuglia has are good for. And this is exactly where I started this journey. And I started this journey with a very simple, maybe naively simple question. What does NG Duglia do? So to tackle this problem, we used a mouse model, and we specifically killed NG Duglia in specific parts of the brain, and then watched brain deal with the loss of NG Duglia. Wherever we looked, we saw this function. The other kinds of glia were like broken down nuclear plants, just spilling toxic waste all over the brain. Neurons were hampered. They couldn't transmit the signals as efficiently. So with so much in disarray, we thought this must have a beha behavioral translation. And this is where we hit the mother load. This is where pieces started falling into their place. NG2 glia removed mice were more anxious, they showed social avoidance, and they were just sad in a mouse kind of way. <laughs> anxious, joyless, asocial. It looked awfully like depression in mice. As we kept digging, we discovered more and more parallels between the defects we saw in our uh, mouse model and the previously identified cellular uh, signatures of depression. This is where we thought we had to make the round trip. What I mean by this is, if removing angiotuglia induced depressive-like behavior, then we had to see what would happen to angiotuglia when we induced depressive behavior. 
at this point, naturally, we were in need of an animal model of depression. Many models of mouse depression rely on environmental stressors to induce depre depre depression-like behavior. And the one that we used was called social defeat stress paradigm, and it goes as follows. Mice are subjected to daily attacks from a more aggressor, from a more aggressor set of animals over, a ten, uh, over 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, two populations emerge from these abused animals. One is a susceptible animal. Susceptible animals show all range of depressive-like symptoms. And the resilient animals that, have, that show no, absolutely no effect, and they're completely resistant to stress, and you don't, you don't see them acting nothing like the susceptible animals. So when we looked at these two populations, and we examined the angiotuglia, a fascinating trend started emerging. Angiotuglia, again, was first to react, this time to acute stress in depressed animals. At the end of 10 days of chronic defeat, however, angiotuglia numbers were significantly reduced. And then we later on showed that this reduction in angiotuglia might be causal for the dysfunction in other kinds of glia and eventually neurons. You see a completely different recipe for depression surfaces. Breakdown of not 10%, of the hundred percent. Instead of m malfunctioning of a neuronal machine standing over a glial chassis, it's the malfunctioning of unique and indispensable parts that was supposed to work in symbiosis. We now stand in unexplored territory. It's too early to tell whether ng how ng and depression are intimately involved in the details of this involvement. But one theory seems promising. ng loss and eventual dysfunction of other glial subtypes and neurons might very well be a triggering event in the development of the depressive state. The very definition of depression might be due for a revision to include a more prominent glial component. Depression recently has hit a bottleneck, as m m some of you might, m may know. As current medications, cur current antidepressant medications, produce a lot of unwanted side effects and remains surprisingly ineffective for a large number of animals, uh, sorry, not animals, patients. The reason for this is that depression therapy suffers from a lack of targeted therapies. Prozac, for example, will increase serotonin everywhere in the brain with no sensitivity to local circuitry. So whether this treatment will result in mood elevation or whether this mood elevation will be masked by insomnia and nausea is a complete gamble. So if it is precision we need, we need to take a second look at glia. They know much more about instructing and modifying neuronal circuits than we do. So how about glia-targeted drugs that, that aim at glia, restoring the glial function to put the dysfunctional neural communication back on track. If we have a fish tank with dirty water in it and your fish are dying, it doesn't matter how much you treat the fish, how much you medicate the fish, their support system and their habitat, are, they're compromised. So unless you change the water, you'll fish keep, your fish will keep dying. On this greatly positive note, I just want to end with this. 
In April this year, President Obama announced brain research through advancing innovative neurotechnologies, aka brain initiative, funding a massive research effort to map all the neuronal connections of entire animals and then eventually human brain. If you ask me, the acronym brain is a bit of a misnomer and a, and a dangerous one at that. If the ultimate goal is to map the entire brain function, this project is condemned to fall short by about 90%. Thank you. <laughs>